Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I know, it's been a long conference already, right? So um, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this session that honors um, the winner of last year's Early Career Award. So we are very lucky to hear from Julie Poselt, who is an associate professor, associate professor. So she's on the fast track. <laughs> Woohoo! She's at the University of Southern California and, as I, and a 2015 to 2017 National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow. Her research examines organizational behavior affecting access to and equity in selective sectors of higher education, especially graduate education, research universities, STEM fields, and the professoriate. Julie Poselt is the author of Inside Graduate Admissions, Merit, Diversity, and Faculty Gatekeeping, which is from Harvard University Press, 2015. This is an award-winning ethnographic comparative study of faculty decision-making in doctoral admissions. Her second book is under contract with Stanford University uh, Press, and additional research is published in AERJ, Annual View of Sociology, Journal of Higher Education, Research in Higher Education, and Chronicle of Higher Education. So you're kind of getting a sense of why she was last year's um, committee choice. She's a member of the Editorial Review Board for the Journal of Higher Ed and the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. Her work has been funded by the U.S. Department of Ed, by the Spencer Foundation, by Mellon, and the National Science Foundation. She is principally presently a principal investigator on four NSF-funded projects, working to advance equity and inclusion in STEM doctoral programs and research settings. She directs the California Consortium for Inclusive Doctoral Education, as well as the Inclusive Graduate Education Network's Research Hub. In 2017, Julie was honored with the Association for the Study of Higher Education's Early Career and Promising Scholar Award, so we were not the only folks to recognize her promise. And in 2018, of course, received the AERA Early Career Award. I will tell you as a member um, and chair of that committee that one thing that impressed us, besides obviously the scope um, and substance of her work, is the fact that she is looking at equity issues um, at the point of sort of doctoral admissions, which is really um, brand new work um, in the area of higher education. So without further ado, please uh, welcome Julie Poselt. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Lin, and everybody who's responsible for organizing the conference, for nominating me, and for selecting me for the 2018 Early Career Award. Uh, I want to start by honoring that here in Toronto, that we're on land and waters, uh, that were first settled by Mohawk, Mississauga, Chippewa, and Anishinaabe uh, to communities, as well as other indigenous peoples past, present, and future. And I also want to thank out loud the Convention Center staff and hotel staff whose labor enables us to have a comfortable and beautiful setting to learn and connect with one another. I worked for five years in college and high school and grad school off and on as a barista and as a wait staff, and so I appreciate long shifts on my feet. So thank you also for being here. Um, it's pretty cool to look out and see familiar faces, friends, mentors, uh, colleagues from different seasons of my career. Um, the work that I'm doing now in the world is really the result of loving parenting and a great education, as well as a whole system of privileges that I want to talk about today. Uh, I'm really grateful for the various institutions that have supported my learning and my work. Uh, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, I worked at the University of Northern Colorado, and the University of Southern California. I'm also really grateful for the people who have financially funded my research. It wouldn't be happening without an amazing team of graduate students. Raise your hand if you were a graduate student who has worked with me at some point. Yeah, some of you, thank you. Um, it's a real joy to be a professor, and um, I really appreciate that the system of graduate education that we have in the United States today doesn't happen without external funding. We don't have a government that helps sponsor that like the UK does. So today I have kind of a rare privilege of saying pretty much whatever I want for the next hour. Um, and then discussing with you for the time remaining. So I'm going to be pulling together some of the key themes to which I've dedicated my time and brain power and passion for the last five or ten years. Now, um, I'll say, these are interesting days, if this was working, these are interesting days to be a scholar of admissions. 
it's especially interesting to be a scholar of admissions at USC. And it would be fun to take the next hour, hour and a half, and commentate on the admissions scandal and the fact that the University of Southern California is in the hot seat. But those aren't actually the issues that I think are either most pressing or most productive to have a conversation about with the group that's gathered here. Um, rather, I'm eager to talk about graduate admissions, uh, recognizing that many who are here today are either graduate students yourselves uh, or professors serving graduate students. It's frankly been a little bit of a surprise to me how much more interest there appears to be in having a conversation about graduate admissions in the hard sciences and in the humanities than in the social sciences and in education. Nodding heads, yeah. So um, I'll use this rare platform that I have to start a conversation in AERA, and we'll see if it goes anywhere. Um, I hope that my research doesn't just give you food for thought about education as a common field of study, but also as a shared workplace in which we all have room to do some reflection and learning. Now, to get us started about a conversation about something that's so abstract as the social construction of merit, I want you to take a look at this beautiful fish who's so surrounded by water that it probably doesn't even realize it until it gets outside of it. Culture operates the same way. We're usually so surrounded by people who think the way that we do that it's hard to perceive that what seems normal and natural to us is actually the product of a culture in which uh, we're immersed. Until, of course, we get outside of it, it's easy to forget that the paradigms that drive what count as merit emerge through human action, through human agency, through real choices by people at some point in time, to fulfill certain purposes that may or may not still be relevant, which may or may not be equitable. So if there's a theme in con the conversation today, I want you to remember that amid all of the forces that are institutionalizing inequality, that human agency is still a part of the game. And the fact that we accept or deny the agency that we have will determine whether we inherit and carry on the system of admissions that we received from the people who admitted us to graduate school at one point in time, or whether we're part of improving it to reduce inequities in the next generation. Now, every application to graduate school is reviewed amid cultural expectations and societally mediated attitudes about merit, power, and opportunity. They provide the same sort of filter through which we make sense of information as it becomes available to us. But it's often taken for granted that we should be thinking and talking about prior academic performance, that we should be assessing students' merit at an individual level, or that we should even really be using a logic of who deserves to be admitted to make decisions about who goes to graduate school. Why not auction off spots in the most coveted universities? That seems to sometimes sort of happen in its own way, right? Why not a logic of random chance or a lottery if what we want is equal opportunity? Those working in higher education inherited both their prior generation selection systems and they received students at the end of a long educational system that stratifies at every turn. It's no wonder that so many people appear to accept as inevitable that the outcomes of our own selection systems should likewise produce social inequities. Now, where do our admission systems come from? Sherrick and Young, in their wonderful essay, Coloring Epistemologies, put that on your list if you haven't read it, said that we, as our predecessors did, live, work, understand, think, and act within a particular social construction. We do not live in some universal sense above culture or history. We live inside a culture, inside a civilizational social construction. In our case, meritocratic beliefs, the idea that some people are more deserving than others of educational and professional opportunities, emerged and entrenched itself over hundreds of years of European and American history, really since the decline of monarchy governments. These beliefs can make it hard for us to perceive how whiteness and socioeconomic privilege are deeply embedded in what counts as merit. Now, if we were to apply a litmus test to the racial and economic pH levels of the cultural water that we're swimming in when it comes to admissions, guess what? It would not come out neutral. It is especially pernicious for inequities in that uh, the ways in which the same logics of merit drive selection also are part of the mindsets of the faculty who educate our students. Those mindsets about excellence and intelligence, they don't simply go away once the decision is made, right? And so we have to confront them if we're thinking about the quality of the education that we provide, not just the quality of the evaluations that determine who should get in. I want to argue that our ability to shift from a logic of merit that centers achievements, who's ready to, quote, hit the ground running, and who comes with the most impressive credentials should be shifted to a logic of potential and who has the effect of who can reduce inequalities of who enrolls. Now, meritocratic beliefs, as I mentioned, can make it hard to perceive the ways that whiteness and socioeconomic privilege are built in. But what's important to recognize is that those meritocratic beliefs have power. They help to cloak the inequities that have since been institutionalized as normal. 
So uh, before we get going any further than that, I want to take a couple of minutes to cover some definitional work so that you know what I'm thinking when concepts and jargon come up. So first, I think of merit as a principle of dessert. I got that definition from a philosopher. And one of the reasons it's such a slippery concept is that it's highly contextual. For example, uh, the concentric circles that you see up here on the screen represent some of the various contexts in which evaluations and judgments are made. So I, as a professor, thinking about who should be admitted to a graduate program, I'm going to have a sort of hierarchy of preferences and priorities um, that are important to me. But that's not the end of the story in most places. That set of preferences has to be negotiated with those of the department and the committee that I'm working with, the discipline that I'm a part of, and that are part of the broader professional environment that we're in. So merit ends up being a sort of institutionalized compromise across all of those different contexts that are simultaneously informing what gets counted as good, what gets counts as excellent, and what really constitutes quality. Now, insofar as present definitions of who merits, belongs, or fits in these various contexts, those are the product of historically contingent systems of power. And they tell it to tend to elevate interests of groups of the insiders who founded them. To put a finer point on it, accepted definitions of many professional, intellectual, and cultural boundaries in academia privilege white, male, wealthy interests, for these groups wrote the rules by which the academy proceeds. Although racial inequalities are not the only ones institutionalized in admissions, they are among the most invidious given our history. Critical race theory provides a lens for understanding how and why this is the case, and it ground, provides grounds for taking a closer look at merit. In particular, two of its tenets are important, I think, that racism is endemic and institutionalized, and that we have to question claims of meritocracy and liberalism with respect to the opportunity structure. Now, to have a robust conversation about meritocracy, we're going to have to talk about the role of whiteness in the social construction of merit. So, let's be clear, we're talking today about institutional racism, and if that makes anybody uncomfortable, I encourage you to take a deep breath, but not to leave. All right. Whiteness is a cultural quality of organizations, of products, and of all sorts of institutions that have been created by and for white people. It includes assumptions, privileges, and benefits that are associated with being white and which have become assets in seeking opportunities that white people now tacitly expect and rely upon, and in many cases try to protect, often without their realization. Indeed, if there's a single answer to the question my title about how admissions institutionalizes inequities, it's that the legitimized criteria and processes for carrying out admissions systematically privilege white people. They similarly privilege wealthy people, and in some fields of study in universities, they privilege men. So embedded in how I've been talking about merit and whiteness is the word institution. And institutions are important here um, because I'm not talking about educational organizations necessarily. That's one type of institution. But I'm working from institutional theory um, in which we think of it as established laws, practices, or customs. And that can include everything from democracy as an institution to the institution of a handshake, as well as dominant paradigms about who deserves educational opportunities. Luis Menand uh, wrote a great book about faculty's uh, ambivalence or resistance to change. It's like 700 pages about why faculty don't like change. Okay? Um, and one of my favorite quotes in that 700 pages is that institutions are recalcitrant and the conservatism of professors an ancient source of ridicule. So I do want to spend some more time talking about institutions. Broadly, I'd say that my talk, uh, talk today is going to be about one-third theory geeking out, because how often do I get to geek out about my theory? Uh, not often anymore. Uh, one third talking about the empirics, and then about one third talking about implications and some just reflections on what I've learned. So let's dig into theorizing the construction of merit. Um, a lot of my work relies on new institutional theories to understand the tendency towards stasis in higher education and where dominant paradigms about merit come from. Weber was one of the first to talk about the importance of status as a resource for organizations. And indeed, legitimacy today is a key resource for organizations. In addition, field-level conceptions of merit um, are extremely important constraints on organizational behavior. Now, in a system that's as obsessed with status as higher education is, here's what happens. Organizations align themselves with what the most powerful organizations the systems are doing, or they start to play by the rules through which they might gain status. But what happens is that uh, if elites or the paths to status present barriers to equity, guess what? Admissions practices and others like them that are aimed at status seeking will along the way reinforce the relationship between prestige and selectivity, and they'll do so at the expense of inequity or of, of equity. But merit's also a lot more personal than that. So that sort of casts field level forces that are operating out there, they're impinging on our decisions without our necessarily being conscious of them. 
Goffman's dramaturgical theory is very different in that it reali relies on individual perspectives and how we make sense of our decisions in the world. He compares social life to the theater and says that most of us are going about our day-to-day -day playing certain roles and adhering to certain scripts that we think will be acceptable to the people around us. I actually was thinking about this today and wondering if the things that I had to say was going to be acceptable to, uh, to all of you. I'm not entirely sure. We'll see. Um, in everyday life, though, we know that scripts consist of the stories that we tell ourselves to help justify some of our day-to-day -day actions. They don't necessarily have to be totally true. They just have to be acceptable to the people who are listening to them. And by using the same scripts over and over, we start to lose track of the fact that they're not necessarily true, that they're just taking on legitimate status. Now, Michelle Lamont has been a really influential figure for me intellectually, and one of her biggest intellectual contributions has been in recognizing how identity-related identity related boundaries, along with those field forces of status struggle, reproduce inequalities in organizations. She would argue that access into a community, insider status within it, or receiving honors and opportunities are all rendered by members who judge who best embodies the fit with the definition of a community's symbolic boundaries. So she talks a lot about symbolic boundaries as being these sort of conceptions of distinctions that are made by actors to categorize objects, people, practices, and even time and space. Organizations' judgment about values like intelligence, fit, collegiality, and the conduct of good science, for example, operate this way. And for their use in allocating opportunities, resources, and status, the boundaries can be thought of as cultural tools that do the work of inclusion and exclusion. They provide cognitive and cultural grounds for social closure, promoting a sense of solidarity and identity by virtue of imagining others as being distinguished from who we are as a community. So they're very important in situations like admissions because they allow us to make grounds for saying that some people deserve in and other people do not. And as an example of this, some of you may have read a piece or a, all of Jeremy Carabell's book, The Chosen, and may think of it as a sort of heavy tome that's reporting the history of elite admissions. But I think of it as an excellent application of new institutionalist theory, personally. Uh, on the political nature of defining what should be considered merit, Carabell wrote that the very definition of cultivation, or in the modern world of bureaucracies, merit that predominates in a society, expresses underlying power relations and tend accordingly to reflect, reflect the particular cultural ideas of the group that holds the power of cultural definition. By its very nature, the process of defining cultivation and merit, far from being neutral, is thus a profoundly political one. Here, Carabell observes that if you have the power to define cultural qualities like merit, you shape ideals. So then the question becomes, who's shaping our ideals today? Are we letting another generation shape what count as our ideals? We should be the ones, I would argue, to be shaping the ideals of our generation. We're going to have to use agency to do that, but we also need to know how professors, how men, how white people think in order to understand what it would take to undermine the present paradigms that drive how people are evaluated. You don't necessarily need to espouse racist or sexist views in order to participate in institutional racism. The socialization process that many people get in graduate school um, allows you to learn and adopt the values of a given cultural community. And they can cause you to lose sight of the fact that it's pretty arbitrary that we rely on what we do to make the decisions about who should get in. Like the prisoners in Plato's cave, we can forget that the prevailing views of merit are like dancing shadows on the wall. They're not natural, they're not given. They were socially constructed for particular purposes and they've been maintained over time to fulfill those purposes. So, with these ideas in mind, I want to argue now that at the end of the day, decision makers are ultimately the ones who d construct what counts as merit in practice. And until we understand how they think, how they talk with each other, how they work, we don't really understand admissions. So, I'm going to move now from the theoretical to the empirical part of this talk and discuss four particular ways that inequities are institutionalized. I'll talk about the unintended consequences of relying on scores from admissions exams where performance is not equally distributed by race, gender, or class. Unless we think of test optional policy as some sort of silver bullet uh, for admin admission inequalities, I'll also discuss recent evidence that skewed judgments of fit, decision maker social identities, and disciplinary worldviews contribute to the problem. Uh, I don't have time to talk about the full scope of admissions realities that are relevant because I do want to leave time to talk about the second part of my title, my hope is not lost. But the way that the Supreme Court defines how we can talk about the uh, types of inequalities that we have, the variety of institutional practices that are currently beginning to be questioned, as well as, you know, 
terrible things like this Rick Singer dude um, making it possible for people to get in with just a check. Um, obviously, those are part of the bigger conversation as well. Okay, so let's talk first about reliance on admissions exams, because obviously that's a, that's a really key part of this. And it's actually how I got into the study of admissions. I was really fortunate as in, in my graduate program at the University of Michigan to work with Mike Bastido, Ozan Jaquet, and Rob Bilby on a study funded through AIR to look at how over time the structure of access to selective undergraduate institutions has changed. And so three papers came out of that project. I was an author on two of them uh, presented here. And the study that looked at racial inequalities and how they've been uh, changing over time basically found that despite overall growth and over academic preparation, and despite rising um, uh, enrollment in the post-secondary sector, that we're seeing enrollment odds in the most selective institutions decline over time for black and Latino students. And this is during the period of um, affirmative action. We see over time that increasing reliance on SAT and ACT scores um, helps to explain this. So I, um, I don't have the numbers up here, but you can just imagine a beta coefficient getting bigger and bigger over time for the SAT variable across four cohorts. Interestingly though, and as depicted on the chart or the table on the left, increasing shares of the black and Latino students in the most selective institution are from the top SES quartile. So we do see a sense of there being intersecting systems of privilege um, that are affecting this. The other major finding from this study is that increasingly, academic preparation is necessary but not sufficient grounds for access to the most selective institutions. So this figure depicts the increase uh, from two cohorts in the percentage of people who are enrolled in the most selective institutions who are extracurricular leaders in high school. Big increases to suggest that over time, uh, there are increasing roles for both academic and non-academic factors. The uh, competition is increasing. Next, what I want to depict is the racial and gender disparities at the graduate level and what that looks like in terms of uh, what we can expect from an admissions process that relies on graduate uh, record exam scores. So uh, what I want to do is flip through a number of different disciplines to show you how the disparities by gender and race uh, play out in different fields. Now, it's probably going to be too small for those of you maybe even in the front row to see. I apologize for that. But along the bottom, we have Asian American, white, other, other Hispanic, Mexican American, American Indian, Puerto Rican, African American, and then the two on the right are male and female. And what you have are the 25th to the 75th percentiles for GRE quantitative scores, with the hash in the middle being the median. So you can see here that Asian American and white students uh, have significantly higher scores than students from other uh, racial and ethnic groups, and that men have significantly higher scores than women. But that's not just isolated to the physical sciences. Here's what it looks like in engineering. Here's the social sciences. Here's the humanities and arts, education. Here's all students who have grade point averages of 3.0 or above. Now, those are good students, right? So we see the same racial and gender disparities among students getting A's that we see uh, from students across the entire academic uh, distribution. Interestingly, here's what we see for mean SAT math scores, a similar sort of pattern. And here's the same patterns for eighth grade and fourth grade math scores. Now what I want to show you is the percent of students who are not living in poverty. So again, we see an intersection here of racial and socioeconomic privilege driving who is getting especially high scores that are relied upon increasingly in admissions processes. So when we look at what explains it, yes, indeed, and even ETS would say that differences in educational access at an early age help to explain this. But research from education and psychology has found also that stereotype threat, the sort of subconscious anxiety of confirming negative group stereotypes uh, is part of this uh, uh, disparity as well. And then research on the GRE has found some really fascinating stuff, like if you have a pro test proctor who is the same uh, race or ethnicity as you are, you're much more likely to get a higher score. So the testing experience, along with these lifelong educational access issues, are part of why we see disparities in GRE scores. Now you're going to get what I hope is the only pop quiz of your AERE experience. I want you to imagine a world in which there were two folders who were applying to graduate school that were equal in all respects, except one of them had a quantitative score of 740 on the GRE, which on the old scale, which is coming back to be the new scale, by the way, um, is an 80%. And the other one had an 800 that was perfect. So just take a minute and think, which one would you choose? Well, I can say it's a bit of a trick question. Um, according to ETS's Guide to the Use of Scores, which 
pretty much no one reads. Um, it's an inexact measure. Like all statistics, only score differences that exceed the standard error of measurement should be used as a reliable indication of real differences in knowledge and developed abilities. So now you get exactly one guess about what the standard error is on a 740. 60 points. Now, for those of you who are professors, I don't know about you, but when I've been in admissions committee meetings, both in education and outside of education, people make a lot bigger of a deal of uh, 20, 25 points than even 60 points. So to the extent that you can bring this message back to your colleagues, um, to remember that the GRE is a statistic, and like all statistics, it has a standard error that bears recognition. So on the one hand, um, you have faculty who say that they care about equity. Our institutions are engaged in conversations about diversity. So why is it that they are relying upon admissions criteria that undermine those goals? Uh, I had the harebrained idea in about 2009 to do my dissertation on that question. Uh, and I'd been interested in access to graduate education, and I'd been interested in it graduate admissions issues since I worked with the McNair Scholars Program from 2003 to 2007. But it wasn't until I uh, read two books, Mitchell Stevens' Creating a Class and Michelle Lamont's How Professors Think, where they actually observed the decision-making of faculty and admissions, that I thought someone needs to do this with doctoral admissions. And uh, thanks to Mike Bastido, I was allowed to do that. So my dissertation asked the questions, how do faculty individually judge and collectively select applicants to highly ranked PhD programs? What assumptions about merit drive faculty judgment? And how do disciplinary norms shape faculty judgment? So I conducted a comparative ethnographic case study um, in 10 PhD programs at three universities. This involved a total of 85 interviews with faculty and a few grad students. I can mention that if you ever have the opportunity to interview emeritus professors, you should definitely do so. They love to take out all of the skeletons in their closet, and they'll bring their dogs, and they'll light candles and incense. They're just really fun to talk with. Uh, and in six of the 10 programs, uh, they actually allowed me to sit in on the admissions meetings, and that was, as you can imagine, a fascinating experience. Looking at the fields that I studied, um, it represents the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. And then within each of those, I tried to get a balance across fields that are typically classified as high consensus, economics, philosophy, physics, in which a sort of centralized and hierarchical knowledge structure uh, I thought might lend itself to more homogeneity of thinking than we would find in fields like linguistics and political science, where people come from many different types of epistemological socializations and even disciplinary worldviews. And indeed, you know, spoiler, yeah, it matters. So if we think about very broadly what explains this contradiction between the espoused values that faculty hold and the practices that they display in the admissions process, I argue that the evaluative culture in these programs helps transform preferences for certain criteria and processes into institutionalized inequalities. And it does so in several ways. So first, the preference for certain criteria was rooted in beliefs about what they think they signal. Um, and these beliefs, because they were very related to their own personal um, ideas and identities as scholars in elite programs, really played an important role in their reluctance to loosen their grip on them. Second, uh, preference for a process that was efficient and collegial was extremely important. So faculty wanted to quantify quality if they could because it would allow them to not have to discuss the differences of opinion that they held. It would allow them to minimize conflict and as many people reported to me, save their dis disagreements for faculty hiring and faculty tenure decisions. Third, in the high consensus fields that I studied, there was a really strong pattern of what I call disciplinary logics shaping how faculty thought about merit, defined intelligence, and what they thought the admissions process should look like. And then in fields that didn't have that sort of intellectual backbone to them, individual preferences were much more important. And in these places, there were four different types of homophily, or love of the same, that drove how faculty thought, which I'd be glad to talk about a little later. And then finally, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that deep ambivalence about change of any sort, but especially reforms related to diversity and equity were avoided because they encouraged faculty to confront the potential that they were either complicit or actively participating in systems of racism and sexism that they didn't want to be associated with. So, why do faculty rely on GRE scores, taking us back to those disparities? Well, here's where that theory of scripts came in really handy. Remember that these are the stories that faculty tell themselves to justify some of their taken-for-granted preferences and behaviors. I found that faculty associated GRE scores uh, and grades, which they took to be conditional on the rigor of the curriculum and the prestige of where those grades were earned, with intelligence, and that they associated intelligence with 
belonging in an elite intellectual community like their own, as well as whom they thought to have an acceptable risk for degree completion. So you can imagine these scripts operating like peeling back the layers of an onion. It looks on the outside like what they're really paying attention to are GRE scores, but it's because they think of those GRE scores peeling back that layer with respect to intelligence. And then when you ask them why are you thinking about intelligence as you do, it's because they associate it one layer further with belonging and risk. So let's look at some of the data about this, okay? Um, in interviews, I asked every single person, what do you think GRE scores signal? And more than 50% of the time, faculty volunteered some sort of idea about intelligence And when I asked them this. I heard phrases like sheer intellectual horsepower when they were trying to be cute, and many more instances of native intelligence than I would have expected to in 2010 and 2011. Here it was extremely helpful to be able to triangulate my data with observations, because I saw that again, more than half of the times that the GRE came up in discussion, it was within the same breath, within the same paragraph, within the same sort of thought as well, um, some sort of mention of intelligence, okay? And so I created this code in my data called Smart Talk that was a real, um, whatever the opposite of a treasure trove is. Here's a couple of examples of how people talked about high scores and low scores. Someone who does that well on the GRE is unlikely to be lame-brained. They are likely to be smart. That was in philosophy. And then I heard many different versions of, uh, I question she has what it takes. And then in biology, this example of belonging. He was from a different planet, and we were confident that this person was not going to be one of us. He's not going to be a full member of the scientific community. Now, second, um, with respect to risk aversion, it was one of the most prominent themes in my data. Faculty felt like risk aversion was both the sort of obligation that they had in terms of making smart investments, but also that in these highly selective programs, it was a bit of a luxury. That if they felt confident about students, why should they be admitting students about whom they had concerns? That being said, I was pretty inspired to hear people interrupting faculty who were making comments that were so uniformly um, based in poorly evidenced assumptions of risk that it could help interrupt some of the patterns of, of discourse that were systematically leading to over-reliance on scores at the absence of other factors. So these are what I call challenges to the risk aversion script. Here's an example from philosophy. Her GREs of 690, 740, and 4.5 present a risk for her not succeeding, particularly because she didn't attend a top-rated university. Lynn said, she may have undershot. This is an area that can be gendered. We have to be very careful here. And then Bob says, all in all, it gives me doubt. And it's that last word I want to draw your attention to, doubt. That in competitions that are as stiff as this one is, that any introduction of doubt can be enough to really downplay someone's opportunity. Here's another example of somebody challenging the risk aversion script. She might be a bet, but it could be a good bet. If we're going to increase diversity, these are the students we have to take seriously. So Jack asks, what's the diversity? And one of her colleagues says, family financial hardship. So they keep talking about her, but um, they decide to move her forward. Nancy says, it'll be good for the whole faculty to take a look at her file. Uh, it seems pretty clear that she's of risk, but if we want to increase diversity, we have to take risks. And then Denise says, and she seems like a good bet. And this is again highlighting the fact that every student has a sort of risk profile that to some degree is known or unknown depending on the evidence available, depending on the assumptions, depending on the quality of the statistics, depending on lots of things that are really not accessible to anybody at the given moment. But I do want to highlight again the language of betting, the sense that students are being uh, treated, in, objectified in many ways as bets. So. All of that is one good reason why we have to question our assumptions about risk, we have to question the interpretations that we're making of GRE scores. But that's not enough. The whole second phase of the admissions process is driven on what is something a little bit more like holistic review. And here I found that judgments of fit really represented white and socioeconomically privileged interests. Now this is also true at the undergraduate level, I'll highlight again that selective ju institutions judge institutional fit second only to academic metrics when they're thinking about admissions. And that college admissions really proceeds as a sort of storytelling action among people who are involved in deliberations. So that whoever has the resources to put together really attractive uh, applications become constructed as the best candidates, regardless of what their likelihood of success is, regardless of what kind of contribution they're going to make to the community. Now, an interesting study that I want to highlight uh, from 2018 has looked at the question of intraracial discrimination, a factor and a phenomenon that I saw way too much of. That when faculty were making discussions of applicants from a similar racial and ethnic background, they wouldn't necessarily be judging students against common criteria, they would judge the students against one another. 
This was an audit study of applicants, uh, uh, pardon me, of uh, college admissions counselors. And they put together emails that had four different narratives. Two in which the student who was writing to the admissions counselor did not seem to have their race be um, salient. One that they categorized as racial unity. And then a, a third, pardon me, a fourth, the, um, in which they had anti-racist descriptions. So all of them started with what you can see here in the middle that admissions counselors were being contacted, uh, and they're writing to find out whether they would be believed to be a good fit for someone with their interests. And basically what they found is that counselors were more responsive to black students who presented as deracialized and racially apolitical than to those who evinced a commitment to anti-racism or social justice. Now, in my experience, this is a question of power and how faculty think about the role of power in the admissions process. Because I found, too, that faculty were reticent about applicants of color and white women whom they thought might do things like, and these are quotes from my data, rock the boat, come with a chip on their shoulder, or have an ax to grind. They were really concerned that students would be bringing uh, dynamics into the community that would upset the existing power relations. And so I want to show you a little bit of what this looks like in the context of a dialogue. This is from an astrophysics committee that was all men, um, a really fun group of guys. Uh, they came from a very diverse set of backgrounds, but they were all there that day to make a decision about who among their applicants should be nominated for a scholarship for women. Okay? And so here's how they had that conversation. Is it enough, Juan asks, to be a woman in silent, uh, science? Prabhat says, Lisa said she wants to be a role model because she never received explicit encouragement until recently. She wrote about the importance of providing active support, not just the absence of discrimination. Wayne says, Shauna says she needs to develop self-confidence and overcome self-doubt. Juan says, and then there's Amy, who claimed to experience teasing and bigotry from her peers and a high school science teacher. She went to an all-women's college so she could still study science. Chris, who was the graduate student on the committee, said, I'm less persuaded by that story. Maybe the teacher was young and inexperienced in handling high school boys. She might come to the program with an ax to grind. And then Juan says, either way, now she's taking action, organizing a lecture series for women in science. We need to read between the lines on these things. So I love this dialogue here. And when I'm doing workshops with faculty, I put it up, and then I ask them to do a little parent share activity and ask them to identify the language that they consider to be problematic, as well as what they would do if they were in such a meeting themselves, how they could respond in such a way as would interrupt the flow of a conversation that's headed in, in this direction. And it's pretty interesting to see the variety of ways that people interpret this common text. Now, what I want to argue is what's happening here is an example of implicit bias. People don't necessarily realize that the way that they're talking about women may manifest their assumptions about how women are in science, or that women who co come with different experiences are going to operate as a woman in that environment differently. But there's plenty of evidence that implicit bias is present in many types of selection processes in higher education, only one of which, so far, has actively looked at the graduate admissions process. Katie Milkman and her colleagues, in an awesome audit study, sent out uh, a series of 6,500 emails to professors in 89 disciplines that were identical in all ways except the name at the bottom. And what they found is that faculty responded significantly less often to prospective students whose names suggested that they were black, Latino, from Chinese, Indian, or female backgrounds. And when they did respond to people who had names that suggested that they were from these backgrounds, it took significantly longer. Unfortunately, for universities like my own, these effects were strongest in private universities. Another great study, if you haven't read it, by Trix and Pasenka found endemic gender bias in letters of recommendation for faculty um, being considered for medical positions. Letters for women were shorter. They were more likely to lack some basic features of a letter of recommendation. They lacked concrete references to the applicant's record. They lacked evaluative comments about their traits or accomplishments and they were less aligned to be um, with the research record and the ability. They were much more focused on the personal qualities than their professional ones. Finally, I want to highlight a new study by Nick Bowman and Mike Bastido that found that the reviewer identities make a big difference in terms of what the outcomes of admissions processes are. Again, an audit study found that with 300 admissions officers attending the NACAC conference from 174 selective institutions, Admissions officers from historically underrepresented groups were much more likely to admit lower SES students. They found that having more work in admissions and working at one's own undergraduate alma mater were associated with providing lower recommendations to low SES applicants. So this suggests that when you're making admissions decisions, you're not immune from the effects of your own backgrounds. And this is consistent with a host of social psychological research that needs to be taken into account when we're thinking about what good evaluation for admissions looks like. 
Finally, I want to go back to the disciplinary cultures theme because it's been a really important part of the work I've been doing the last few years uh, through work that's been funded by the Mellon Foundation and the National Science Foundation in the humanities and the physical sciences. And here, one of the emerging findings that started to come out in my dissertation research, but which is I'm finding all kinds of new evidence for, is that disciplinary worldviews denying the relevance of social identities to scholarly work is a barrier of its own that helps to institutionalize inequalities. So the inability to see the relevance of social knowledge or the inability to see the relevance of one's own identity ends up leading them to admit students or to think of people differently than places where they're aware of the research on implicit bias or willing to listen to the data when it becomes available to them. Now, this is um, not necessarily something that's just coming out in projects of the sort that I'm doing. Um, some of you may remember an important moment during the Fisher case where Chief Justice John Roberts just asked straight up, what unique perspective does a minority student bring to a physics class? Well, it turns out there's quite a lot. And perhaps the story is somewhat different if we're thinking about basic skills in introductory classes rather than original research. But research has found uh, that there are practical benefits of scientific research teams at all stages of the research process. They start with better ideas, they engage in more cognitively complex problem solving, and the products that result from racially diverse teams end up getting cited more often and coming along with higher impact factor. So this is another one of those slides that I love to be able to share with people who haven't necessarily been exposed to the, the relevance of this research. But the problem first is if they don't believe in social knowledge, it's going to be harder for them to believe it than if it came about using some sort of you know, physics experiment. So um, in the research that I've been doing now, I'm seeing that disciplinary worldviews have institutionalized barriers in a few ways. One, this idea that people rely on the language of their own discipline to help legitimize decisions that otherwise they know would be considered discriminatory. But also that elevating theory over applied knowledge and the value of individual discovery over collaborative work has legitimized a really narrow way of doing research and a really narrow way of training our doctoral students. Right? So we don't necessarily encourage uh, collaborative dissertations. We don't necessarily create opportunities for students to teach and work collaboratively. There's also two emerging findings that I thought I would share with you today. One is that strong desires to treat diversity and equity and inclusion issues as problems that can be fixed and treating them as issues that really operate like a single cause, single effect relationship is getting in the way of their ability to see the systemic nature of inequity. Okay, um, And then when they think about those issues, they sort of conglomerate them all as what a phrase I'm hearing way too much called, oh, that diversity stuff. It's put into a category of thinking that is not necessarily relevant to the way that they carry out or define their subject matter. So one pattern that has it's begun to emerge in the case studies of STEM disciplines that I've been doing is a tendency to approach um, admissions and inequities as a problem that can be solved uh, by admitting a few new people. The trouble is when programs admit and recruit a few such individuals without affecting either a critical mass or paying attention to the quality of the climate or the culture that they have, students will end up coming to campus, perceiving that environment, and ultimately choosing to enroll elsewhere. And obviously this is magnified when a few of the students of color who are enrolled have negative stories to share. Uh, in a study that's going to be coming out this year called Bait and Switch, uh, some of my students and I from Michigan report a really interesting case study of a psychology department that went gangbusters on changing their recruitment and admissions practices while paying no attention to the quality of mentoring and climate that were happening within that department. So you can imagine that after a spike in enrollment, they were not able to sustain those gains. And over time, they're now having to sort of revisit their strategy and pay attention to the fact that the worlds that they create within their departments, within their labs, within their individual mentoring relationships matter just as much as the quality and the shininess of the website. So all of this I'm trying to argue um, is, nece is necessitating a more systemic approach to paying attention to this. And indeed, some of the chemistry departments that I've been looking at have demonstrated a very different approach, where they pro approach it as learning. And this is one of the hopes that I think we can have, is that we have a, a community of people who have dedicated their lives to knowledge. And the extent to which they can engage in this as a learning process, I think is something that uh, gives me a little bit of hope. Um, another department that is a really positive case study that I've written about with my students as well um, really worked on the boundaries between their field and others. They worked on the boundaries of social and scientific knowledge. They tried to de-sort uh, of 
hierarchical, not, it's not really a, rule, a word, but I want to say they, they de-emphasize the hierarchy within the department between the faculty, staff, and students, so that students were empowered to be leaders within the department. And they tried to genuinely create a sort of uh, set of family type relationships. I am finding, however, though, an interesting pattern in which equity efforts reflect broader disciplinary cultures. And so we've got to be able to find ways to work with rather than against the disciplinary cultures we have. Uh, for example, the American Physical Society, with which I have uh, a major grant, has a real managerial culture, and they treat critical consciousness as a, a very radical notion. So I'm thinking these days about what does it look like to take a managerial culture, one that's very top-down and explicitly so, and engage them in deep conversations about identity. It's not easy. We have in astronomy sort of the opposite. They're a real advocacy culture. They believe in having ideas and agendas, and uh, they really believe that it's their role to set out best practices. However, it's very small, and because they are very non-hierarchical, they struggle with coordinating and implementing change. And then in uh, the geosciences, I had a really unique opportunity to observe what field work looks like and how to make that more inclusive. And so I'm thinking with them about how to take the culture that they have and use it toward equity and inclusion. All of these projects are ones that I have done collaboratively. So perhaps one of the biggest lessons for me in this is that uh, research that is going to be taking apart these wicked problems of inequality can't be done in isolation. And I'm deeply grateful for those of you in the room uh, who have been collaborators in this, and for those of you perhaps that might be in the future. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a forthcoming book with Stanford University Press in which we're talking about gender and uh, racial and socioeconomic equity in STEM graduate education. And one of the major uh, findings from this that I'll share today is that the definition of subject matter expertise has not historically been defined around teaching, around mentoring, around management or teamwork, really anything social at all. This is completely a new world for faculty in these disciplines to be able to say what culture is. So, Although more and more faculty want to be known for contributing to culture change, recognizing that there are issues, they can't tell you what culture is, much less how it changes. They don't think diversity is substantially different than pursuing equity or inclusion. And they don't define their professional role to include that of a learner, much less an activist or an advocate. So these are cultural uh, questions about these disciplines and what it's going to mean to work within them. So questions that I'm thinking about are, to what extent can we use the forces of institutional isomorphism toward equity? How can we productively engage faculty as learners, especially faculty from disciplines where pride is really important? And then finally, what gets lost when privileged people are defining and leading equity efforts? I think that's probably one that we could have a conversation about for a very long time. So my current projects are looking at disciplinary-based research practice partnerships and trying to think about how faculty can better evaluate and educate graduate students within them. And one of the features of this is developing better uh, holistic review efforts at the graduate level. I'm fortunate to have a colleague, Casey Miller, who's an expert in STEM graduate education, um, who keeps me honest by reminding me of what scientists know and what scientists don't know. And uh, together we've been developing a model of holistic review in which we have three main arguments. One, that it has to be comprehensive, taking apart many different criteria. One, that it has to be contextualized, and this is true at the undergraduate level as well. And third, that it needs to be systemic. It's not enough to just say we're talking about lots of different factors and weighing them. We have to be ha uh, a little bit more disciplined than we typically have been. Because what happens and what a lot of people think of as holistic review is they end up talking about things like hobbies and hairstyles and hometowns that are totally irrelevant to graduate education, but that can be gendered, that can be racialized. So to revisit the original questions, how does admissions institutionalize inequity? The answer? It's the social construction of merit, okay? Decision makers are rarely conscious about the equity implications of the work that they do, and they're personally bound to the norms by which they're making evaluations. We see that the process is legitimizing inequities as natural or necessary outcomes of the admissions competition. But at the same time, why is hope for change not lost? It's the social construction of merit. People wrote the rules of this competition. They have broadly rewritten them at least once, and they can rewrite them again. Indeed, many people are already trying to do this. I think often we forget that standardized admissions exams emerged as a response to social pressure to change the admissions process. Now they feel entrenched. Now they feel like too defining a characteristic of the admissions process. But we're underway a process by which that is being reevaluated. And then finally, I would say that the same processes of nego negotiation that have created the hierarchies of preferences today can be used to reorder priorities or reimagine them entirely. 
So I'm going to close with some strategies that will help to center students in the educational mission, strategies that will um, serve other, other goals as well. We can align admissions criteria to intellectual mission. Um, Lonnie Guineer wrote a great book called The Tyranny of the Meritocracy in which she argues that we should be better making admissions directly linked to the mission of what we're about. Okay? So to the extent that you can, think about admissions to what and for what. Avoiding the use of cut off anything to disqualify students. We need to contextualize students' experiences and metrics. Actively considering distance traveled the extent to which students have come a long way given the opportunities that they've had relative to privileged students who have similar records, and being able to think systemically and across units. Kim Griffin wrote a really excellent paper with Marcella Muniz that was looking at why it is that graduate diversity officers struggle so much with fulfilling the requirements of their job. And basically, it's that they do really great work with recruitment, and then what happens is the names that they've recruited get carried forward to admissions committees, and they fall right through the cracks, because there isn't good coordination between the various offices that are thinking about who might diversify our programs. When we think about disrupting the whiteness of meritocratic admissions, there's also some basic things we can do. One is to de-emphasize or don't consider at all any student qualities in which we know whites people have had demonstrated advantages. A second one is to get serious about holistic review and be systematic about it. Third, and I would encourage this for anybody in the room, to check yourself about what impresses you because chances are what impresses you is not neutral, it came from something and probably deserves to be questioned. Certainly we need to see more diversity um, in who is actually running admissions. One of the things that I thought for a weakness was a long time of my dissertation was how white and how male my sample was. And I used to say that in, in, in presentations. And someone approached me and was like, you have to stop saying that. That is the world of graduate admissions today. And so this is the world that we need to deal with. And then additionally, I don't know what it's like in your department, but I think the more comfortable we can be talking about race in everyday terms will allow us to do so more openly in admissions. And then finally, thinking about some practical strategies for uh, checking implicit biases. Encouraging enough time for the review of files, avoiding premature ranking, which is a cognitive bias called anchoring bias, using a rubric or other evaluation form to help sort of discipline the way that you're looking at files. It actually makes it more efficient too. Being transparent about the criteria that you're using rather than just going off of your impressions. Selecting diverse groups for file review makes a difference here too. And it's important to be able to be accountable, both to your colleagues and to the broader world. Um, some of you may not know that the Trump administration has stacked the Department of Justice with lawyers that are friendly to lawsuits on affirmative action. Uh, and so a lot of graduate programs today have nothing on paper about how they run admissions. And certainly, if ever there were to be a lawsuit, this would not put them in a very strong position. So it's another important takeaway for graduate programs. Finally, all of the sociology of evaluation says that we should be comparing applicants against standards, not against one another. Uh, but too often, there becomes this intraracial discrimination practice. Thinking a little bit about what it is that we know makes a difference. We know that when leading programs are working in solidarity, they can start to overcome some field level pressures. Um, we know that when people question their assumptions, they can start to delegitimize and rewrite some of the prevailing scripts. But none of that is going to matter if we deny our agency or fail to encourage it in others. And so I have to call out my student, Steve Desir, um, with a question that he once raised. Do you know the agency you have? And he wants to ask this of admissions officers to see whether they actually feel like they have any agency in the admissions process. But I would turn that to all of us as well. Do you know the agency that you have in your jobs from what positions you're in, whether you're a graduate student or a faculty member or somewhere else? No doubt, our challenge is great. Uh, and in facing it, wouldn't it be cool if we had a team that was like this? Um, it can be tough when it seems like the folks that we're working with are such a far cry. And indeed, one of my projects, this is what I got instead. It's not exactly a team of superheroes. It's a very smart but somewhat ragtag group. But that doesn't mean that we stop working. We're educators, and that means that we are never working with fixed resources. We believe in people as learners who can improve as we go. Now, I can say that as a white woman, um, it's been really interesting for me to work in spaces uh, like this where I'm described as contributing diversity uh, to the group, either intellectually or socially. And it happens sometimes in education, too, where I'm the only woman on a panel of senior men. I've learned that presence is one resource, but that my agency matters for the kinds of conversations we have and the kinds of questions that we ask each other. 
I've also learned that one of the most powerful processes for encouraging agency is moving professionals from a posture of skepticism to one of engagement. They don't have to get on board, but they need to be able to be part of the conversation. I find too, as you might be able to see in these pictures, that sometimes I also need to be moved from skepticism about them to greater engagement with them as well. I've learned how the classic parent-share activity builds a sense of agency because it corresponds to what Freire and others decide as two key mechanisms for the development of critical consciousness, reflection and dialogue. It is amazing how far a little parent-share will go with people who otherwise don't think of social knowledge as relevant to them. I've learned in my early careers that none of us can learn and work as well alone as we can with community and support and people who push us. I've seen the satisfaction and the power of receiving great mentoring and paying it forward to the next generation. I mentioned earlier that Mike Bastido encouraging me to do this harebrained study of graduate admissions that I really wanted to as a doctoral student was one of the best gifts I've been given. And if you're a graduate student who has not been extended that uh, freedom or support, I'd love to talk with you because I'd like to help you wisely navigate what is a politically complicated but personally important situation. I've also learned that we're more confident in ourselves and our agency when we're working together, optimizing teams that are diverse in thinking, in experience, and identities on many dimensions. It makes me very happy as a professor when I see my students step up and lead, um, own their own agency and leadership in small and big ways. And at the end of the day, to be able to celebrate the small wins with friends and family that I love. I may not be Wonder Woman, and you may not be Black Panther, but together, there's no way that our generation will simply pass along the inequalities that we inherited from the people who came before us. Thank you. So I believe that there's a microphone going around for people who have questions. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I took a bunch of pictures. I was the annoying person taking a bunch of pictures. Um, I have a question for you, especially when we look at graduate school admissions. Knowing that the undergraduate admissions are biased and have similar problems, um, it drives me crazy that my department still puts such an emphasis on where the person came from. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. I feel like there's almost a double bias now because you're deemed kind of twice, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the process. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, yeah. So um, in 2017, I published a paper on trust networks. And I talked about the way that faculty discussed institutional prestige and basically found that uh, even faculty who had come from modest backgrounds and less selective colleges themselves would be very impressed by either students who had come from elite institutions or who had letters of recommendation from people who were well-known in the field and that it was really not just about belief in the selection processes that had preceded it, but that the reputation enabled a sense of trust in a situation where there are so many uncertainties that you're looking for a reason to emotionally engage. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think people get dinged in lots of ways for their institutional affiliations, but um, ironically, people seem to be willing to take up that bias a lot more easily to me in the conversations I have with um, them than, than the questions around metrics because people want something standardized and they recognize that um, the system is so stratified at the undergraduate level. One of the projects that I'm currently working on right now, um, it's funded by NSF to look at access from CSUs into UCs actually, um, in physics and astronomy only, but it's using a bridge program model and trying to model the networks of application, um, admissions, and enrollment between these uh, to see if people over time come to have more trust in applicants from less selective institutions if there's been some prior engagement with them, either so that that engagement can overcome the bias that they might have or in the opposite direction, give them confidence in the student's ability to engage in research since that's such an important part of the process. But yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things that we can do is open up our sense of networks. Social closure is a huge part of the reproduction of inequality and a big part of social closure in the admissions process is the institutions we deem to be legitimate or not places to have received your undergraduate training. But it's layered. It's both the institutional affiliation and then at the doctoral admissions level, who you're getting those letters from that tends to make a big difference. 
and they're related, of course, right? Yeah. So first of all, thank you for your work and thank you for your book because it gave me ideas for my dissertation. So oh, good. thank you for that. <laughs> you inspire your students, those that you see and that you don't see. So I hope you know that. Thank you. Um, my question is about results and what to do with it. So the question is framed as, did you share your results with the committees you observed and what did they do with it? Oh, yeah. Because I'm so glad you asked you, that. what we see a lot of times is no matter how much data for equity we generate, no matter how clear it is, it just gets ignored in ways that for other conversations, when other people bring up their data, we <laughs> can't even touch it. Yet you seem to have developed a study that's 100% valid, 100% obvious, the results are glaring, so what? You know, it's like, what changes? How do you do this? And if they are just being ignored, I hate to sound Derek Bellion pessimistic, but where do you get your hope from? Yeah. You know, because it seems like no matter what you do for white supremacy, it's just going to say, oh, that was good and just move on. So yeah. when you shared it with them, what was the reaction? Was there any implications, et cetera? That's sure. Me. So um, as, as a well-trained qualitative researcher and as somebody who believes deeply in the idea of reciprocity with my participants, I did uh, member checking with each of the department chairs or admissions chairs, whoever was kind of my main institutional gatekeeper. So I didn't say too much about the methodology for that study, but it was a comparative case study. So I brought the case. It was like five to ten single-space pages to each of the admissions chairs and then had a sort of, you know, sweaty palm conversation with each of them to see what they thought and uh, you know to a one they said oh my goodness yes this is this is what's going on here um, a couple of them had details for me to fix um, a couple of them brought them back to the admissions committee and uh, in two of the departments it led to some really substantive changes so that astro astrophysics department for example that I highlighted they have since totally transformed their process um, one of the departments uh, which shall remain nameless changed their GRE policy as a result. Um, one of the departments realized that they had been relying much too much on their individual rankings and uh, the averages of their rankings to determine where to draw the line. So they so they put the work to um, in different ways, but not consistently enough that I would say they're at all what I'm getting any hope from. I feel like I really needed with this study to be able to focus on dis defining the problem so that future work could look at how to better engage with faculty around it. And I see the projects that I've been doing since then, and especially in the last couple of years, as, as that. So um, I just have received four grants over the last year that are all about faculty professional development to improve the evaluation and education of students. And it's about how do we take what we know about the problems with the system and engage people in reflection about changing the process. So I spend a lot of time doing workshops now. Um, it's exhausting, and sometimes they go better than others, but there have been some really common patterns to the changes that are being made. Uh, one is GRE policy changes. Another is the implementation of evaluation rubrics. And one of the key things that I do with everybody is force them to define their own. I might give them some ideas to start with. But it's really important for them to have the conversation where they're defining for themselves what's important to us, what does really good, acceptable, and unacceptable look like for us. Um, and then the third area of change is, just as you were saying, Linda, uh, surrounding how we think about uh, institutional backgrounds and how can we be more purposefully recruiting students from either nearby um, MSIs or uh, engaging more with community colleges. So uh, yeah, the bits of hope that I get are as much from the engagement in those projects as the sense that we are part of an interesting moment where there's a national conversation about this at both the undergrad and the grad level. And um, where the bandwagon around test optional policy will take us, I don't know. Um, hoping to do some empirical research about the different types of outcomes of changing GRE policy or SAT policy without changing anything else. I wouldn't actually be pr particularly hopeful about that. Um, but most of the places at the graduate level that are changing GRE policy are doing so alongside a broader conversation. And that's what gives me hope, the fact that people for the first time are having conversations about these matters. Thanks so much, Julie. It also helps thinking about and wondering if you've had any, you talked about primarily programmatic level, but when you think about school or college level, mm. thinking about 
how rankings may matter more to deans or and that percentage that's the GRE score and yeah. how in working with that. Did you um, have any findings related to the next level? I'm so glad you asked that. Yeah, so Friday I'm going to be at Berkeley Engineering, um, and the California Consortium for Inclusive Doctoral Education has a couple of graduate schools and a couple of uh, like colleges of arts and sciences and a couple of engineering schools. And ironically, the deans and associate deans of the colleges are way more on board with the reforms than the faculty themselves are, because they see that uh, the national move within their fields is for such change. And uh, it's the faculty themselves who are often personally uh, affected by whatever admissions decisions they make. So they're more concerned about admitting a student who's not going to come with awesome research experience or who um, they don't necessarily have the same alignment of, of research interests. So faculty tend to want students who can, quote, hit the ground running in order to support their grants, um, whereas administrators, they're paying attention to numbers, certainly, but I think most administrators these days, um, at least in the places that I've been working, are more concerned with their diversity and equity numbers than they are with the percentage of students who are in certain GRE uh, uh, profiles. Uh, so I don't know if that's true in education. It'd be interesting to get ed education deans together to see where, where those priorities are. Um, maybe, maybe we can get a grant to do that sometime. But um, at, at this point, I do see a lot more eagerness on the part of administrators than, than faculty one-to-one. -one. Thank you very much for your talk, Yuli. It's very inspiring and um, provocative uh, for my work and for thinking about admissions and gatekeepings, gatekeepers, not in the United States, but in the, in the south part of the world, and who is the model, right? What are the reference points, and what are the construction of knowledge? So really touched me the idea that the construction of merit Inter is intertwined not just with the disciplinary institutional layers, but also with the ge geopolitical mm -hmm. um, sphere. And on that context, I am very interested about the organizational procedures and practices. So what we can institutionalize. Um, and I was curious, did you find any type of relationship between those colleges, or those departments that have a greater degree of um, organizational procedures to r admit the students uh, with the notion of merit, where mm -hmm. the question that I'm trying to grasp, to grasp is if we have a better and uh, more standardized practi practices, can we guarantee a more critical um, process of how we are thinking about meritocracy? I love that process. question, yeah, because it corresponds so nicely to different kinds of modes of admissions decision making I've observed. So the humanities, they believe they are doing holistic review. They are comfortable with their subjectivity. They feel like they've got this under control. Their outcomes don't necessarily correspond, but uh, they really believe that what they have done with having it very undefined, very open, very much subject to their impressions and judgments, that that is more holistic. On the other hand, they're on the opposite end of the spectrum are the places where it's highly bureaucratic bureaucratic and very much um, identified into a series of steps and procedures. Now, you might say that the humanities environment is one in which transformation is more likely, both because of the mindsets of the professors working um, with the kinds of epistemologies that they have, as, all, as well as because on the bureaucratic side, they may change two or three of the steps and feel like that's a lot for to do all at once because they're able to say we're making these changes and sort of justify to themselves a reform mentality as opposed to, opposed to transformation. Um, interestingly, though, I've seen that in the humanities where it is a, a less bureaucratized process, uh, the concerns about the law and fears of lawsuits are really profound because they tend to admit very few students per year. And so every student who comes in is understood to be a real investment and the many students whom they have to deny admissions to, they're worrying about what that feels like to them out there in the field in an environment where we're seeing these lawsuits. So I think they're compelled by the notion that they don't have a legally defensible policy and that the creation of any policy could be a good idea. And if we're going to have to create a policy where we didn't have one before, we might as well do it right. So I do think I see more opportunity for a truly um, you know, power-centered analysis and power-centered uh, policy creation process in the humanities. Um, but I see a lot of comfort with reform in STEM, which um, you know, frankly surprises some of my collaborators who are just you know, 
you know, surprised by that. So I feel like our, our, our gradients for change maybe need to be different. You also asked about uh, who our standards are that we're comparing it against. And we don't really have a lot of that, to be honest. So um, one of the things that I was hoping that you might help me with is if you know of departments or colleges that are doing admissions in really unique ways, will you shoot me an email and let me know? Uh, because I'm looking for innovation and not necessarily that there is a good or best practice, because again, what would be our bar for that. We'd have to construct some sort of standard of merit for that. Um, but I think faculty are willing to experiment these days. They're, they're looking to be creative. They're looking to be identified that way. And um, even where there's ambivalence, there's a willingness to listen. Maybe that wasn't there five years ago, in my opinion. And thank you for, for your presentation. So in your book, you study very elite uh, graduate programs. So my question is, in your follow-up research or your, in your other research, have you ever talked or studied uh, with faculty or administrators from less prestigious programs to see, uh, like in terms of their, uh, the students, they are admitting like the diversity of the student population and also in their role, about their role in the reproduction of inequality at the graduate level? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, one of the things that I got really tired of hearing people say was, well, we w we're, we're admitting all of the students, but they're choosing to go elsewhere. They're choosing to go to these top five programs. And so I intentionally, with my second set of studies, focused on uh, public flagship universities, but I didn't set the rankings within the field as being a selection criterion. Um, I wanted it to be selective enough that they had to make admissions decisions that were difficult, but I didn't want it to be so selective that I would hear that set of excuses over and over again, which I think are fairly unproductive um, for, from a transformation standpoint. Uh, and, and what I found in those places is they would actively um, seek out students that they thought that the most elite would deny admissions to, but who were still really good and had a lot of promise. And so I do think that that's a, that's a productive space and mentality to be operating in, where people lose the sort of... Um, uh, sense of being dazzled by people that have uh, credentials of a very narrow sort, where they've opened up their mind a little bit, but they are still thinking about, yes, we want excellence. We want excellence of a different sort or a broader sort than we had before. Um, so yeah, I think that's uh, what I also see in places that are willing to have that conversation is they are thinking about recruitment more actively. They're thinking about the climate of their programs more actively, and they're thinking more about um, the placement of students in individual research groups and what a difference that makes to the quality of students' lives. Hi, Dr. Marcel, it's great to see you. Um, you listed a list of 10 different compelling strategies for us to really consider and sit with. And as I'm thinking about the ways in which we work towards equity and justice, and many times we see lists of sort of strategies and solutions, we eagerly sort of set our mind to just that and work towards those implications or strategies that are provided. So I'm wondering if you can speak about your strategies a bit more and maybe what other contextual factors or other institutional, mm -hmm. or other institutional factors we should also consider mm -hmm. that should be in place so that these strategies are fully sort of implemented with the effect that you want them to see. Yeah, great, great question. You know, a big one is uh, graduate school fellowships. A lot of departments, it turns out, set their policies for admissions based on what will ensure the students whom they admit are eligible for school or university level fellowships. And so that becomes a sort of ceiling effect in what is possible for change. So I love to have conversations with graduate deans. And um, one of the most exciting uh, talks that I gave about this research was to a room of 750 graduate deans. Um, and afterward, you know, they were really compelled by the notion that if we set GRE requirements, the departments will really use that as a mindset too. So there's been an interesting move to sort of decentralize GRE policy decision making to the faculty level. Um, Princeton has done that in the last year. Stanford has done that in the last year. I'm still waiting for my own university to change that, but I'm in conversations with the dean. She's great. Um, so yeah, I mean, graduate deans, it turns out, don't have a lot of power. But where they do have influence, it turns out to be pretty important. Um, and so that's, that's one institutional factor. Uh, another one is the climate. I think people really underestimate what a powerful force in shaping how faculty think and how students feel. 
um, if, if you're in an environment that is really competitive, where students are looking left and looking right more than they are looking inside and thinking about their own futures, you create an environment in which the anxieties are going to manifest in well-being issues that will prevent them from being able to draw new students, because students want to be in a place where everyone's stressed out. But it also manifests in the classes, and so faculty start to judge students along those traditional um, ways of viewing them as opposed to um, a, a more expansive way of seeing student possibilities. And then finally, I think the quality of student mentoring and the presence of harassment within labs and within research groups is something that absolutely has to be addressed. Um, the two most difficult interviews I've ever done were with women who had been either harassed or assaulted by their PIs or their, their advisors and who didn't get support from their department when they went to them about it. And so having some sort of responsibility for faculty um, quality of pedagogy in classes and then quality of mentoring behind the closed doors of their research groups and labs. Right now, faculty have way too much um, autonomy, in my opinion. And I don't necessarily think that we should you know, be implementing implementing new types of oversight, but we do need to make it much more easy for people and safe for people to report stuff when it goes down, because it does and it will. Hey, thanks for the talk. It's nice um, to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Um, really fascinating stuff. Um, I'm wondering if you've had any conversations, because um, I certainly have recently, mostly with mid-career professors, associate professors like myself, who are starting to express increasing worries about admitting all of these graduate students to these programs at all in this context mm -hmm. of what's happening with university um, job placements, yeah. um, performance-based budget models. Um, I've had informal talks with, but several associate professors who are worried that perhaps it isn't ethical to be mm -hmm. admitting graduate students into programs when the future of the institution um, is sometimes in flux. Yeah, yeah. You know, humanities programs are contracting left and right in response to those concerns. I think because. PhD placements and the social sciences and the hard sciences um, doesn't look as bad. People are still getting jobs. Um, it's less a concern there. Uh, but certainly, I think departments need to pay attention to the extent to which students are getting the jobs that they came for. And if they're, if they're students who are applying and that they're admitting, um, no longer seek faculty jobs, but that's still the training that they're getting, that's an ethical issue to me too, that we should be attentive to the full scope of types of jobs that people are getting post-PhD and ensure that we're providing some degree of mentoring for that. One of the things that they've been learning in the engineering fields is that uh, because the concentration has shifted into industry and into um, the the government research sector, that faculty actually aren't equipped to be mentors in 100% of the ways that graduate students today need. And so engaging with alumni who have been successful in other sectors of employment, and then creating what they call mentoring networks is something that a lot of fields are doing. And I think it would be smart for social sciences and uh, education departments to do something similar, to recognize the sort of breadth of job opportunities that are available to people post-PhD, and engage people who are successful in, um, in other sectors than education uh, to provide that support. So it's both the admissions and then what kind of education we're providing. So a really excellent report was just um, put out by the National Academies last year. It's called Graduate STEM Education for the 21st Century. And that was a major theme of that one. Um, and it's, a lot of the findings are relevant outside of STEM as well. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you for your work as well. Um, I work at a system uh, which is not uh, selective. Um, our chancellor says actually he's proud that we accept top 100%. But um, in terms of selectivity and equity issues, I see a lot of parallels um, in hiring practices. Yes. And uh, some institutions, they provide a training for people who will be serving on hiring committees. Um, and implicit bias is a very important topic, I think, very critical. So mm -hmm. the main focus is everybody's looking for a good fit. Yes. And then fit is, as you explained, it based on the people's uh, culture and values on how they're going to look like themselves or not look, uh, look like themselves. Mm -hmm. um, are you 
familiar or are aware of any systematic training programs targeting people who serve on admission committees? I'm building them. Yeah. Yeah, the two of the grants that I have right now are, are dedicated to that either at the national level in the physical sciences, that's the Inclusive Graduate Education Network, uh, which is a very big project with like 30 different partners and it has two different hubs of activity, the Inclusive Practices Hub, which administers professional development activities, and then the Research Hub uh, that I direct, but I'm involved with both of those. And then the other one for California graduate schools is the California Consortium for Inclusive Doctoral Education, and that one is also looking at how to create systems of uh, professional development that are not just uh, like a one-time thought visit, but um, following the stride model within advance, which you may be familiar with, um, is actually, this is the really ambitious part of the goal. If you want to like send me some good energy on this, we're, we're identifying faculty on each of these six campuses who themselves will be able to commit over the next five years to providing that kind of faculty to faculty training for their colleagues so that it's sustainable and so that it's not just about outsiders coming in, but creating a conversation within each of those campuses. So I'm actually really proud of that work. Um, it's taken a ton of time and it's taken um, some, some courage to, to think that actually there may be some appetite for that, but everywhere that I've gone and worked with faculty for sort of one-time workshops, it's clear that they recognize that you can't just begin a conversation and then expect long-term results. That uh, because admissions committees change year to year, there needs to be some sort of infrastructure for long-term engagement in the discussions not only about admissions, but then mentoring and student mental health and constructing curriculum. There's just so much about graduate education that is totally ad hoc, and it doesn't have to be that way. I think about the fact that we have a whole field called teacher education at the K-12 level, and there is no such faculty education field of study, although I'm seriously hoping Ariel Rogers will lead it for the rest of her career, uh, my, one of my PhD students. Um, because we do need faculty who are skilled. We do need faculty who don't just go to a, like a, a couple workshops when they're in grad school, but who have resources to continue growing. And some of the on-campus offices that are available, there's no incentive for faculty to participate in them whatsoever. So like a lot of places have a center for teaching, but there's no engagement or incentives. So it's both making available opportunities, creating faculty who are willing to provide it from whom other professors will think that there's some legitimacy, and then also creating incentives to participate in it. I'm curious where you see graduate students fitting into the advocacy work that you're yeah. talking about right mm -hmm. now, especially when it comes into complete culture shifts that you're um, that we've been talking or that you've been talking about for the last mm -hmm. se several minutes, um, and also within the tenure and hiring of faculty and what that looks like in terms of advocacy from a graduate perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in the departmental case studies that I've been doing for the last several years, graduate student organizations was a major theme. And it wasn't something that we went in going to look for, but it just turned up over and over and over again. And we selected these departments because they were all um, significantly more racially diverse than their fields or had significantly higher shares of women than their fields. And so we don't think it was an accident that in these places that have a different composition, that they also have active graduate students who are pushing the agenda and faculty who are responsive to graduate student concerns when they come up. So in those environments where there's a healthy, honest conversation between graduate students and faculty, Faculty, I think you see much more possibilities um, for, for change to occur. I know we've seen that in Rossier, and it's been really, really productive. Um, and it's an ongoing process. So I think that's one of the challenges is that the, the, what feels like change from a faculty member's perspective may not feel like change from a student's perspective because the faculty member was able to look back five years and say, these are the changes that we've made. And the graduate students who've just come in, they come into a world that still needs a lot of love and they have different uh, issues that need to be pushed. Um, here, the classic model of campus climate turned out to be really important for us because what we found is that faculty were defining changes in the climate with respect to policy change and 
compositional change. Those are two dimensions of the five climate uh, uh, model. And uh, students were defining them with respect to the perceptions and behaviors of faculty and the sort of quality of feeling respected within the department. Uh, and so I feel like that's the real challenge is to touch the levels of everyday lives of uh, graduate students and um, ensure that they feel that they belong, that there aren't micro hierarchies within the department. And one way to make that happen, I think, is to have a more open and honest conversation about um, individual faculty-student mentoring. <laughs>